first, thank you to attend our sessions. Today I will give a discussion, um, talk about the, how we use the Intel Optum DC percent memory to accelerate the Spark workload. So uh, this is the camera. Uh, so let's first have an introduction about ourselves. Um, I'm part. Of, I'm come from Intel SSP DAT team, and uh, the DAT is short for Data Analytic Technology Team. And our team do uh, active contribution to the open source, including uh, a few key components for the big data areas like Spark, Hadoop, HBase, and uh, Hive, and all and all, all other things. So we have about <coughs> 30 committers from our team, and also it's a global team. We have China team, US team, and India team. And uh, our mission here is that we try to make f uh, make full optimized for the big data to make sure that uh, the big data workload can run best on uh, the Intel platform. Okay, so I, um, um, yeah, so Pietro is our colleague, so he will, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Pietro Balzer. I'm a software architect in a group at Intel called Non-Volatile Memory Solutions. And uh, we were tasked with uh, enabling software for a persistent upcoming Intel product, Intel Optane DC Persistent Memory. And we do that through developing something we call PMDK, so, uh, which is Persistent Memory Development Kit. Today, before we talk about anything Spark related, uh, we have to first answer the question, what the hell is persistent memory, right? Because that's a very new concept that not many people might have encountered before. So, <clears throat> Uh, traditionally, uh, in your application, you will have a um, hot data tier will, that will be located in DRAM, which on DRAM is usually very small, it's very expensive, and uh, it's volatile. So all of the contents of DRAM uh, vanish when the power goes down. And then we have the cold data tier, or warm data tier, uh, whatever you call it, uh, which contains uh, the persistent but non-volatile data. But this comes at the, uh, it's fa far cheaper, but it comes at the cost of um, <coughs> performance, right? Because uh, block, normal uh, SSDs or HDs are usually accessed through block storage interface and they have to go through the kernel and all of that uh, difficult, expensive stuff. So Intel, Obtain DC persistent memory uh, slots in, in between those two tiers, between a uh, cold uh, block storage and warm and hot uh, DRAM tier. And because it combines the properties of both memory and storage, it's both uh, non-volatile, non which means it retains its contents across power failures, and it's very fast, it's um, just a tiny bit slower than DRAM, um, but it actually has the same uh, access characteristics as DRAM. So you can just use normal load store semantics uh, to, pers to persistent memory. We are going to be talking about later how we actually access persistent memory from the file system, from the operating system. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the uh, product. Uh, this product was announced a couple of weeks ago on the April 2nd. And it's part of um, Cascade Lake platform. So Intel Optane DC Persistent Memory it is, are just DIMMs, normal DDR4 DIMMs, compatible DIMMs, uh, that slot into the same slots as normal memory, uh, but have all of the awesome properties that I've been talking about. So they're non-volatile and very fast. But uh, the thing that we are going to be taking advantage in Spark is its capacity, because uh, this memory has a much bigger capacity and um, density than DRAM. So on this slide, you can see that the available uh, densities go up to 50, 512 gigabytes. And you can slot in up to six uh, of, of, the, of, of those DIMMs in a single socket. So um, if you have two socket server, then it's easy to calculate that you can have up to six terabytes of memory in your system, in your server. So that's quite a lot of space uh, for your whole data. Uh, 
persistent memory is, uh, can be configured, Intel obtained this persistent memory can be configured into two modes. We have something called up direct mode, which you can, uh, which you can use to directly take advantage of uh, persistent memory. And we, we also have something called memory mode, in which uh, the uh, obtained memory is transparently exposed to the operating system as just simply more memory. So uh, instead of having just the capacity that comes from DRAM, you can now have a volatile form of memory that is a combination of DRAM as a cache, that works as a cache, and underneath that we uh, have the obtained persistent memory, which is larger. Uh, so in Spark, we are going to be using the updirect mode, which then we can use uh, to directly modify the application and tell it to use uh, one uh, memory location, so persistent memory location instead of a DRAM location. So we can control the data placement effectively. Uh, so persistent memory is exposed uh, to the application through uh, the file system. So it uses just the, the same normal interfaces as uh, storage. So uh, you can just create a file system, uh, it, but it has to be a persistent memory aware, aware file systems. Uh, on, uh, currently, that, that is XFS, EXT4, and NTFS. And then you can just use normal re read-write syscalls. But that's, that's again, read-write syscalls mean that we have to use block storage uh, pages. Uh, so to avoid having to uh, go through the kernel to access data, and because this is persistent memory, so it behaves like DRAM for accesses. So we can use normal load store semantics, which means that um, we don't have to go through the kernel. We don't have to have that control point. Uh, so uh, to enable applications to directly access data and use normal load store instructions, uh, we developed something called DAX, and that stands for direct access, which means um, uh, it allows the application to memory map uh, the uh, persistent memory into uh, the, uh, the address space of the application and bypass the page cache, because page cache is what you will traditionally use uh, when you use memory maps. And because we now have a very, very fast memory, we don't really need the page cache to uh, amortize the block storage. So we can, using DAX, we can just simply map uh, the system memory into the address space of the application. And then we can use the load store uh, instructions of the CPU. And that's, uh, that's literally the, the fastest path the application can take. And um, what this ultimately means is that the application can now store data persistently and, uh, on, on storage uh, using the uh, load store instructions of the CPU. And that was never possible before. So there is no, nothing in between the application and the, the, the storage. Uh, there is no software, there is no firmware. Um, it just, um, well, there is firmware. <laughs> uh, there is nothing in the kernel space that you know, interferes uh, with the application performance. Uh, so with that, we are going to be talking about uh, how we actually take advantage of that in Spark. Thank you, Pierre. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, today, uh, the, the Spark is running very well in a very fast and uh, um, very, very easy uh, for the users to use. But you know, sometimes a customer may facing some uh, very easy, uh, uh, some memory issues. Uh, the picture in the left hand is showing, uh, a, a, it's a capture for the auto memory issue from the Java side. So we, we hear a lot of customer complaining about the, the memory usage, so that some, sometimes they try to configure the uh, per code memory for a, a specific workload, but the one, when they try to run another workload, they easily to run these uh, issues. So what about, uh, so sometimes we try to figure out what if we can extend the existing memory in, into an even large capacity to, to uh, bypass this kind of issue. Uh, the picture in the right hand is, uh, uh, is a shuffle capture. 
So you can see that by uh, at this point, the, the shuffle for spa is designed for uh, very easy to spill, uh, uh, spill over when the memory is under the pressure. But um, you can see the picture here that we, we do see a lot of spilling. So it, it, it will do harm to the overall performance, especially it's a very shuffle heavy workload. So um, what's the, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, what we are uh, doing in SPA side. Um, we, we have a few optimizations at this point ready for customer to use. The first thing is uh, take, uh, to take advantage at the input side. We have a project called OAP project. Uh, it's short for optimized analytic package. And uh, by leveraging, leveraging the OAP IO cache, you know, sometimes the customer, for, for the on-prem customer, they may use the, uh, still use the hard disk uh, for the underlying data storage. So the I.O. Will, will be the bottleneck here. And for, also for those uh, on-cloud users, they may use, uh, put those data into uh, remote storage like Azure or AWS uh, S3 storage. But the overall network, especially for the input data, it will be uh, the bottleneck for the overall system. So OAP is try, IO cache is try to address this problem. And um, um, by leveraging the open DC persistent memory, we can have uh, even higher capacity um, uh, than the previous DRAM based implementation. And also, um, um, we do see a lot of performance benefit uh, because you know, we can have ne uh, much less cache miss in that case. Uh, the second use case is about the uh, K-means workload. K-means is, uh, uh, is one of the machine learning algorithm, and it's a typical interactive queries, uh, sorry, interactive workload, which means that the training data will be repeatedly accessed during the training phase. So um, before we have this kind of technology, I mean the often discipline memory, we have to leverage the tiered storage, which means that part of the data is in on heap, uh, in DRAM side, and a part of the data is in the storage, like SSD, locally. But now we have a very large capacity of memory, so you can put the entire data set into the uh, authenticity percent memory, but you, you can achieve a even better performance than the previous tiered storage design. So um, we will show more uh, details about these two optimizations at this point. So the, the first use case is, wait, let's begin with the spa cycle. Um, this is the um, page showing the OAP project in details. So it's uh, optimized, uh, the, just as I said, it's optimized analytic package, and uh, you can use it from the uh, website down uh, uh, at the button, and uh, it's totally free for you to use. And the goal here is that we, we try to use the OAP IO cache to address the problem for the, those IO intensive workload, especially for the on-prem hard disk uh, users and also those cloud users. Uh, and uh, so this is the one goal here. And uh, another thing that we want to uh, leverage in the opt-in DC percent memory to uh, speed up the SPA cycle by using the high capacity and uh, high bandwidth throughput. And also, you, you see that uh, there is a low latency uh, com uh, and also reduce the DRAM footprint. You know, DRAM is, um, um, uh, sometimes we, we will leave, leave the DRAM to the computing computation. And also, better TCO here. And uh, the feature we provide uh, by the OAP is that the first thing that we, uh, it provides the front grand cache, which means that uh, when you try to, for example, you, uh, you have a table uh, ABC, uh, but uh, for your workload, you just uh, uh, access uh, the first column A. So we just, uh, for our current implementation, we just uh, uh, cache uh, the column, uh, column A. Uh, in, because column A is more hot data comparing to the other, the rest of the column. So in that case, uh, it, it, we will make the space more efficient, especially for the cache. And uh, the second thing is that we can have the cache aware scheduler. So this uh, feature is done, uh, through everything is uh, based on the public API from the Spark. So now we based on V2, and the V2 API provides the preferred, preferred location, which means that uh, for each scooter, it can report the, uh, the cache information back to the driver, to, uh, and the driver side will maintain uh, 
uh, global map to ensure that uh, I can schedule the uh, task uh, based on the data locality. And the third one is the self-management uh, for the uh, Optin DC person memory pool. So as you know that uh, for the own heap memory, it's managed by the Java. So when you uh, hit the, uh, um, the, the capacity of the DRAM, I, I mean the own heap, uh, it will do the GC for us. But uh, for the off heap memory, actually we have to do by ourselves. The good thing that the OAP provides the capability in the, uh, in the library level. So the upper layer application do not care, uh, and also Spark do not care about how the, uh, the memory is allocated and free. Uh, we abstract this in our OAP project. And uh, the, the last thing that it's very easy to use, you can just turn on and turn off. No change for the Spark and no change for the uh, queries, I mean the workload. So this picture is showing the uh, total hierarchy for the OAP project. So for the, at the bottom is the, um, the hardware, the Optin DC percent memory module. And um, we, uh, to max, maximize the performance, you need to uh, use the uh, P memory aware file system. And uh, uh, just uh, as Peter just introduced, and you need to mount the file system as the DAX option, uh, short for direct access. And on top of that, we, we have a native library which is called a vMemory cache. So this layer is trying to abstract the hardware and also the cache implementation. And uh, this is a native layer. Um, on top of that is the OAP. It's a Scala-based uh, implementation. So it will provide the features like scheduler and also the frame-grained cache based on the data source API, public API. And uh, on t beyond this layer, we have the unchanged Spark and the unchanged SQL. So, so it's total transparent to the users. Let's see how it's the deployment. Um, so user, uh, when we try to do some queries, the user will do the, uh, send the uh, SQL to the, through the Spark gateway like Spark Thread Server or Spark Share. And uh, we, we have the add-on package uh, run on top of Spark. So uh, the scheduler will try to figure out which, um, uh, by, uh, it will provide the cache aware scheduler and they send the, the task to the, uh, based on the locality, it will send to the executor, right, executor. And uh, the executor side will de uh, decide whether we, I already cache that, that data. If not, it still fetch data from the local storage or in, in cloud environment, it will fetch from the remote storage. And uh, if we cache miss, uh, cache hit, then we, we will go through the native layer and uh, get, retrieve the data from OptinGC percent memory. So this is the deployment thing. So for the customer side, uh, user side, uh, there is no change for their original SQL. Uh, okay, so let's have a deep dive for the uh, cache design. Back to Peter. Thanks. Uh, so let's now talk about how we actually implemented the LRU caching that's going on underneath Spark. Uh, so Cheng's first attempt uh, used something we called libmemkind which uh, uses jmalloc to allocate memory from uh, full of persistent memory. And, uh, it, but it turns out that solution had a couple of problems that I'm gonna be talking about later. Uh, but in general, we ended up doing a different implementation that uh, we didn't implement in Java, but we did in native C. So uh, what we really wanted to implement was a simple, embeddable, uh, lightweight in-memory cache that had LRU replacement policy. And we also wanted it to scale across many CPUs and large capacities of memory. Because remember, like I said, uh, you can have a lot of persistent memory in your system, up to six terabytes um, per, per, per server. Uh, <clears throat> so, we wanted to make sure that uh, everything works correctly when we throw a lot of data at the problem. So you might be wondering, why did we even bother implementing yet another cache implementation or yet another in-memory database? Uh, so in-memory databases, some of them at least, are typically based on just allocating upper system through malloc, and malloc gets its memory from the operating system through 
either S break syscall or the MMAP um, syscall um, it allocates anonymous memory. I know I'm sorry for uh, this much detail, but uh, th this is important for uh, more information. So um, in memory databases, uh, allocate memory through malloc or some kind of variant of malloc. Uh, but, but to take advantage of uh, persistent memory in up direct mode, uh, we are exposing, like I said before, we are exposing persistent memory through the file system. So to actually allocate memory, you have to first open, the, open a file, then you have to memory map it, and only then you can actually uh, carve out some memory blocks out of them, out of that big blob of data that was uh, um, memory mapped. Uh, so this is not how normal memory allocators typically work. So um, <clears throat> Jmalloc, for example, uh, simply allocates memory through uh, anonymous mmaps and um, doesn't really uh, allow the application to control uh, where the memory comes from. It just comes from the operating system. So <clears throat> uh, this is the first obstacle um, in using just regular old in-memory databases. But let's say we could modify a database to use a memory allocator that actually uh, comprehends um, persistence, comprehends that it should allocate memory from a file instead of just anonymous memory from the operating system. Uh, but that's not so easy. This is actually similar to what Cheng's team did initially, and they encountered a fragmentation problem. So fragmentation is what happens when an application intermediately allocates and de deallocates objects. So in this example, we, we are allocating three blocks of memory, and then we are deallocating, so freeing uh, block A and block C. Uh, so, and then we are left with two, three uh, blocks of memory. We have a uh, block on the left and block on the right. And then if we want to allocate a bigger block of memory, then we unfortunately run out of memory despite having enough memory uh, when we, when, if we would combine uh, the free capacity. Uh, so any long running application has to typically uh, somehow solve this problem by either having a, a active defragmentation or implementing its own allocation scheme. This is what Memcache do, does. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's generally pretty time consuming to, create, to do the compacting or defragmentation and slab allocation has its own problems. So uh, we wanted to solve the fragmentation problem but because uh, in Cheng's first uh, attempt, uh, this actually contributed to massive uh, amounts of memory that was unable to be allocated for the use of the cache. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we can actually take advantage of all the terabytes of memory that we have. So uh, we took a lesson from file systems. Uh, because file systems also are long, if you think about it, are also very long running uh, heaps of memory um, that have, have to deal with fragmentation. And the way uh, they typically do that is by allocating blocks or extents. So all their file systems or uh, some file system actually use block allocations and newer uh, file system use extent allocation where the block size is variable. Uh, so we implemented in our cache an extent uh, method of allocation uh, which allows us to concatenate two blocks of memory to allocate a single cache entry. And this works uh, very well. We can achieve very high degrees of uh, space efficiency in our cache. Another pro problem that we have encountered is how to implement a scalable LRU cache. Because traditionally, LRU is implemented using a W linked list. And if you want to update that list concurrently, for example, when you want to uh, get an element, you have to move the element to the front of the list. But to do that concurrently, we have to uh, grab some locks to make sure that, no, uh, that this is actually performed atomically in regards to visibility of other threads. 
And uh, when we benchmarked a naive solution, uh, most of the uh, application uh, time was spent waiting on logs because uh, uh, the log was uh, constantly being contended on uh, by simply retrieving data, so on, on uh, read-only workloads. Uh, so we had to address that problem somehow. Uh, so our solution was uh, surprisingly simple, and uh, you, one might say it was brute force. So instead of simply always moving data, uh, moving uh, cache entries, uh, in the LRU list, we simply put, put a ring buffer, a uh, non-blocking ring buffer, in front of the list, and whenever we wanted to modify that list, we simply put the operation on, on the buffer and executed in executed that operation somewhere in the background uh, on, on evictions. So this, this allowed us to retain the LRU properties all this, uh, while uh, scaling the solution quite well. So this, this uh, I'm showing that because this solution was actually uh, worked very well, and it allowed us to achieve linear scalability on read-only read workloads. So uh, in conclusion, um, the LibVM cache, so the, so the cache that we ended up implementing, is a very simple uh, interface to act to, to get persistent memory and to cache data in persistent memory uh, through simple get put interfaces. And this is an open source project, so if you are interested in learning more information about it, uh, the link down there with uh, we'll take you to the GitHub page of the pro project. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay. So let's talk about, more about the cache layer. So this is the status and uh, Fungram design. So the picture in the left hand is showing the, uh, how the Fungram cache works. So you, original, we have a pocket file, and we have footer, and also a few colon trunks here. So during your queries, we only cache those data touched which means that we can just uh, uh, cache the um, hot data and uh, following the LRI fashion. And uh, through the native library, which um, Piotr just uh, introduced, the vMemory cache, and uh, though then your, your data will be in the, uh, VMem uh, in the Optin DC percent memory. And at this point, we still put the footer file into the uh, Gua uh, Google Guava based cache is on DRAM because you know, we, uh, during our test, we find that it's really small and uh, it's very easy for us to look up certain column. So uh, at this point, we put the footer on the uh, DRAM side. Uh, so this is the farm grand cache. The, the, the right hand is showing the, how the uh, cache aware schedule works in general. So we have a cache sensor in the, uh, in the center. So it's run on the driver side. When, uh, when the Spark try to schedule some task, for example, uh, we, we have a task, uh, task, the first task, it will touch a certain colon, so it will, uh, the schedule will look up the uh, maintained uh, global uh, hash map to see which file, which executor already cached those files. So in that case, it will schedule uh, that task based on the locality. Um, but what if we didn't find any da uh, data cached here? So it will still based on the original uh, logic from the spa side. So it will randomly to choose one of the idle executor and uh, file the task there. In that case, the, the, that executor will cache the data. And the back, um, once it cache those data, it will send uh, through the Spark RPC API, it will re report back to the driver side to update the global hash map. Oh, and it also works for the delayed case when we, we have some eviction happened. Okay, so this is the cache design side. And also we have uh, um, completed a few uh, benchmark. So this is the configuration. Uh, there's a few things need to highlight here that we are comparing with the single node uh, Optin DC percent memory instance comparing to the uh, single node DRAM instance. And uh, now we are, uh, for the, uh, Optin DC percent memory side, we config one terabyte um, Optin uh, memory and uh, plus uh, 192 gigabyte for the DRAM because we still need some uh, memory for the computation. 
And for the DRAM side, we are using 768 gigabyte. So we um, then as the Optin DC preserved memory side, we need to reserve some memory uh, for the computation. So for the uh, for the cache layer, we configured a, a 600 and a, a 10 gigabyte for the DRAM based cache. And the, uh, the, uh, the Hadoop side, we are using uh, eight hard disk for the storage. Uh, so this is, uh, and uh, regards to the workload side, we choose a, a few um, scale factor, uh, like two terabytes, three terabytes, and four terabytes to, uh, to cover the different test scenarios. So like uh, we both fit in uh, DRAM uh, and uh, Optin DC PMM, and also the case that only fit uh, Optin DC percent memory and not for DRAM, and uh, also the case that uh, uh, none of them can fit the cache the data. And uh, the workload is we are choosing some decision support I/O intensive workload, and uh, we try to run those queries in parallel to simulating some uh, multi-tenant uh, uh, workload. So how about uh, performance? The, for the f uh, first uh, test scenario, that uh, we can both fit uh, DRAM and uh, DC PMM. Uh, it's a two terabyte, and uh, just as I say that uh, we have um, the OAP IO cache is a fun grand cache, so we do not need to cache the entire two terabyte scale factor. We just need to uh, cache those data I need to access. So in this case, uh, in this test scenario, we need to cache about 613 uh, uh, gigabyte uh, data, and uh, th this scale factor can fit both uh, the DCPM and the uh, cache. So in this case, we can see a, 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 a set of performance de um, degradation comparing with DRAM, but it's much cheaper than DRAM. So um, we can develop a better performance per TCO in this scenario as well. And for the second uh, scenario, it's about the case that we can only fit in uh, Optin DC percent memory, but not for DRAM. In that case, the, the cache, the need cache data scale is about uh, 90, uh, 920. So it's very close to the uh, config the Optin DC percent memory. So in this case, we can have 8x perform benefit. So um, we, we have some deep analysis for this uh, test. Uh, the picture in the right hand is showing the, uh, the uh, IO pattern and uh, for the uh, Optin DC percent memory. So you, uh, you can see that the IO cache is taking, only play, uh, taking place only in the input side. So um, those queries typically will uh, divide into two stages, uh, the map stage and the re result stage. For maps, uh, map stage, um, now we have the, all the data fit in memory, so you can see very uh, small um, uh, read request here. But for the shuffle, uh, we still have the shuffle data. So uh, for the second stage, we, we still see some read request here. Uh, but uh, comparing to the DRAM side, you can see that even we can partially um, fit some data into the DRAM, uh, a lot of data is still uh, on the storage. So in that case, you can see from the time to time, we have a lot of read request. So your system will be IO bound. So this is the goal that we are trying to address here. And we can uh, we also measure the uh, throughput here. Uh, for this, those uh, queries, the bandwidth is about 18 gigabytes per second, and uh, can, uh, it's much faster than the uh, storage side, uh, which is about a two, um, maybe 300 megabytes around. So it's much faster. And uh, also we test another scenario that uh, now the, those cases can fit. And in that case, the cached data is about two, uh, um, more than one terabyte. So we can still see some benefit in Optin DC percent memory site. It's about 1.66x problem benefit. So this, uh, those is, uh, this result are the um, SQL side. So how about the next use case about the machine learning? So um, before we have the deep dive, we can uh, um, talk about more about the current design for the Spark storage label. So now we have two layers for Spark. The first thing is the DRAM original, and also we have the uh, disk. And for the DRAM, we have two uh, different uh, types, on heap and off heap, but um, bring by the Tungsten project. But sometimes, uh, just uh, the first example I showed that, uh, sometimes the customer will want to extend the existing memory to even larger capacity. So now the Optin DC percent memory fills the gap. Uh, for example, I have Kimmings workload, 
but uh, everything that every time every iteration I want to uh, retrieve my input data again, but sometimes you know uh, the capacity for the DRAM is not e efficiency. So sometimes we still need to fetch data from the storage side. So the performance will be much lower. And also some case like a graphic. Graphic is uh, is try to um, because you know. Uh, when we try to scale out this solution, the network IO will be the bound. But uh, and also the CPU uh, utilization for a graphic workload is not so high. So in that case, we can consolidate those nodes into a smaller uh, size of cluster, but we can still have the good performance in that case. So today I will uh, cover the K-means workload uh, in details. So this is how it uh, basically works for the K-means in Spark. So at first, that your data will locate it in the HDFS and uh, in partitions, and then uh, during the load phase, uh, the data will ca uh, back into the Spark, uh, Spark memory space. And uh, sometimes, you know, uh, it's, um, because of them, sometimes DRAM is not um, enough to hold the entire data set, so partial data is still on the disk. And after that, we have an initialization phase uh, to centralize, uh, to figure out some, randomly to select some central, uh, central IDs. And uh, after that, uh, the, the training phase begins. We have a, a few iterations here, and uh, each time we will figure out uh, the right uh, central ID during the computation to calculate the distance between the, uh, the, the points and the central IDs to update the central IDs. And finally, we, we will get the right result. So it's a, uh, this picture is showing how it works in general. But how about the data, uh, the data flow? Uh, for the DRAM case, I mean the tiered storage. Um, the original data is located in the HDFS in, at the bottom. So you can see that it's still leveraging the, your hard disk or uh, SSD um, for your HDFS storage. And then we will load the data into memory and partially on the uh, storage because of the tiered uh, architecture here. And uh, during the computation, the, uh, for the memory, we can directly, uh, those data is ready to computation. Uh, there is no formal uh, decompress, or sometimes well, as customer will want to use the encryption, but um, there's no effort for those in-memory data. But for the storage, we have to um, first deserialization and the decompression, and also de do the de um, decompress sometimes. So uh, then after that, uh, we will put those data back to the memory, and uh, then uh, those data is, uh, uh, is ready for the computation. So this is the basic data flow works. But now if, uh, how, uh, you can imagine that if I have a very enough uh, memory, so everything uh, is in already ready to, for the computation. So this is the reason that we want to also leverage uh, the uh, authenticity person memory in machine learning workload like K-means. So this is the, our test configuration here. Uh, it's very similar to the, the previous SQL side. Uh, a few things that need to highlight here that is, uh, for the K-means uh, workload, uh, uh, a, key, a few uh, configuration is very important. The first thing that uh, we need to specific the K. Uh, in our case, we, we, we make it a fly. Uh, in the battle, uh, at the battle, uh, and also for the iteration, you know, the more iteration uh, you have, the more accurate your result will be. So in our test case, we use 10 iteration here. And uh, so, and also for the scale factor, it's about 1.1 terabyte um, uh, scale factor. So we can cache entire set into the optimization person memory. So this is the result. Um, we, we measured a different phases for the execution time, so lower beta. So you can see that at the load phase, we still have some benefit because, you know, uh, due to the lack of the enough capacity of the DRAM, uh, your data still need to put into the storage. But in that case, for the optim, you know, everything is already ready for the computation in optim, TC percent memory. And uh, we, we do see a very significant performance benefit for the training phase because, you know, uh, we can bypass those uh, um, IO cycles and also some actual computation uh, like a decompress, deserialization, and something like that. And also we have some further uh, analysis for the uh, result. So the, uh, the picture in uh, above is uh, the, the opt-in side, a uh, DRAM side. So you can see that uh, your com uh, the CPU utilization is not as good as the, uh, the opt-in side because you know uh, your I/O will be the bound, and also you know you have to do, do some extra computation, uh, especially for some compression, decompression, and something like that. 
So this is, they, those things will be the bottleneck for your um, the entire end-to-end -end execution time. So let's have a, a summary here. Uh, the Optin DC percent many benefit here is that they, they have, they brings the high capacity and the low latency and also the throughput. And the uh, two opera um, operation mode um, supported uh, at this point for the Optin DC percent memory. The first thing is the APP direct mode, and uh, the second thing is the memory mode. And uh, the good thing for the Spark is that uh, we can uh, we can uh, have a very uh, large cap capacity of memory and also addressing some IO intensive workload. Okay. Uh, so you want to know more, we have a demo booth uh, here, and also uh, every code here mentioned is uh, already p uh, open source. So you, you can directly download from the GitHub website, and also you can check the, check the PMM.io website for more information. Okay, thank you for, for the attend my session. So any questions?